Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Gaia Has a Fever, a presentation by Dr. Jennifer Thompson, hosted by the University of Washington Department of History and sponsored by the UW College of Environment and the Nature and Health Initiative at Earth Lab. My name is Isabel Carrera Samanillo, and I work in the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at the College of Environment. This year marks the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. While the COVID-19 pandemic does not allow us to hold an in-person event, it becomes even more important to create ways to come together as a community, reflect on our actions in order to look towards the future. I want to express to you my gratitude for joining this event, especially in these difficult moments. The College of the Environment's Office of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion and the UW Sustainability Office collaborated this year to promote more events exploring themes around environmental and climate justice as a way to bring more attention on the fact that Black, Indigenous, and people of color communities have been disproportionately affected by climate change and other environmental issues. In alignment with this sentiment, I want to bring to your attention that the University of Washington acknowledges the Coast Salish people of this land the land which touches the shared waters of all tribes and bands within the Suquamish, Tulalip, and Makalshut nations. Before we formally start this event, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items so you know what to expect and how to engage with Dr. Thompson. This event is being recorded for the purposes of making it accessible to people who could not join us today. A window might have popped up on your screen notifying you about this. For the purposes of time, we will keep all participants muted, but feel free to share your questions and commentaries using the chat box. Your questions will be only shared with the host and co-host and will be read out loud by Dr. Uh, to Dr. Thompson by Professor Glennis Young, Chair of the Department of History, and a John Richman Endowed professor at University of Washington. Having said this, I will let Dr. Young formal introduce Dr. Jennifer Thompson. Thank you very much, Isabel. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Glennis Young, Chair of the Department of History at the University of Washington and welcome across the miles uh, to this event to celebrate Earth Day. We are very glad that you are with us. Uh, before I introduce our speaker, I'd like to invite you to uh, visit the History Department website, history.washington.edu, uh, for ways in which you can engage with the department and its many events. We look forward to seeing you, hopefully in person, at one of the many talks, conferences, and other events that we host during the year. Again, thank you very, very much for joining us. Uh, and now for a few words about our speaker, who we are just delighted to have with us today from the great, great state of Pennsylvania. Jennifer Thompson is an associate professor of history at Bucknell University in Lewisburg, Pennsylvania. She specializes in the post-1945 history of the United States with particular concentrations in leftist politics, health and the environment, and structural inequality. Her book, The Wild and the Toxic, American Environmentalism and the Politics of Health, was just published in May 2019. In this book, she traces four strands of activism from the 1970s to the present, the environmental lobby, environmental justice groups, radical environmentalism and bioregionalism, and climate justice activism. The book has been widely and highly praised. As one reviewer puts it, Jennifer Thompson's The Wild and the Toxic is a concise, pointed, and sometimes provocative intervention into the history of environmentalism. I'd like to also point out that Professor Thompson has a radio show on Bucknell's radio station called Bucknell Occupied, uh, in which she interviews a faculty member, student, or campus guest about current events each week 
She's currently working on an article about connect the connection between oil corporations and international environmental governance. And her next book is tentatively entitled Against Planetary Management. So thank you again very, my, very much for joining us. And now uh, we're delighted to present Dr. Jennifer Thompson of Bucknell University speaking to us uh, on the topic of Earth Day, Gia has a fever. Thank you, Dr. Thompson. All right, hi everyone. Um, and thank you for attending. Um, in particular, thank you uh, for the invitation uh, to speak. Uh, I'd like to thank the Department of History, uh, the College of the Environment, um, and also the University of Washington Sustainability Office, and all of the work uh, that the hosts have put into making this event translate from uh, an in-person talk to a virtual talk. So I really appreciate all of that, um, and I also appreciate all of you uh, who are joining us remotely. I feel honored to speak uh, on Earth Day in this virtual format. Um, I hope that in this time of global crisis and reflection, uh, that something of value arises for you uh, in this talk. Okay, so on the screen in front of you, uh, you see a quote uh, to kind of uh, organize our thoughts to start here. Uh, in my talk today, I'll be thinking about how we currently conceptualize the protection of the planetary environment. Underwritten by a legitimate sense of crisis and impending ecological collapse, hegemonic formulations of environmental protection, sustainability, and adaptation oftentimes frame the earth as an imperiled whole and hold that the remedy for our current crisis will come through the expert management of scientists and policy makers. The danger of these formulations lies in how they further concentrate power in the hands of the few who historically seek to protect their power through an increase in repression as well as in technocratic management. To explore this state that we're in, I'll ask you to think with me about two histories of Gaia, the geological hypothesis, which went from fringe to mainstream in the span of a few <laughs> decades, the histories of the hypothesis reflect the complexities and dangers at the heart of seeing the earth as an imperiled whole in need of expert management. At the end of the talk, I will suggest some alternative possibilities for environmentalism, and I hope we can explore these further uh, in the question and answer session. Uh, and as they said at the beginning of the meeting, uh, for those of you who have questions, uh, you can feel free to send those over the chat function. In 1975, countercultural magazine Co-Evolution Quarterly published The Atmosphere as the Circulatory System of the Biosphere, the Gaia Hypothesis, co-authored by physicist James Lovelock and microbiologist Lynn Margulis. In the article, the two announced their intention to discuss the Earth's atmosphere as an integral, regulated, and necessary part of the biosphere, that is, as its circulatory system. Lovelock and Mark Gulis proposed that the central components of the Earth's atmosphere formed a homeostatic system that was the product of millions, sorry, millennia of evolution. By comparison to all other known planets, the Earth's atmosphere maintained what they described as a chemical disequilibrium of many orders of magnitude in order to remain within the improbably narrow parameters necessary to maintain life. The two asked readers to consider, quote, how the lower atmosphere is maintained at an optimum by homeostasis, and that this maintenance is performed by the party with the vested interest, the biosphere itself. This party they named as Gaia. By 1975, Lovelock and Margulis had collaborated on the Gaia hypothesis for four years. During that time, the Anglo-American scientific communities they sought to engage disparaged Gaia as fanciful, irresponsible, and anti-Darwinian. By contrast, non-scientists embraced Gaia. Throughout the 1970s and continuing today, theologians, eco-feminists, and environmentalists made Gaia into what one historian, Donald Worcester, described as, quote, the most widely discussed metaphor of the age of ecology. 
as Lovelock refined the original hypothesis into a system of planetary medicine throughout the 1980s. He elaborated an earthly anatomy in which certain organs, tropical rainforests, deserts, and coastal seas, held greater physiological importance than others. This conception of the earth as a single organism with the capacity for self-regulation enabled a large community of environmentalists to expand their protection of wilderness, human health, and animal species to include planetary processes once perceived as abiotic. In the late 1980s, when climate change was identified as an urgent problem, Gaia, in particular claims about its fever, provided a compelling framework to express how human activity had upset the self-regulating capabilities of the planet. So today in this talk, I'm going to trace two histories of Gaia. The first is that of the cultural context in which the hypothesis was developed and received. This history will think about Gaia's intersection with contemporary discourses of planetary limits and an imperiled Earth, examines Lovelock's design in the late 1980s of a system of planetary medicine for diagnosing and treating Gaia as a doctor treats a human patient, and reads environmentalist Bill McKibben's best-selling text, The End of Nature, as an expression of the Gaia hypothesis. However, the full history of Gaia is not simply that of a fringe scientific hypothesis embraced by an ecologically-minded public which eventually received scientific validation. The second history of Gaia that I'll tell today is of how multinational oil corporations invested in a particular articulation of planetary health in order to maintain their monopoly on resource extraction. Lovelock developed Gaia while working as a consultant for NASA and Shell Oil in the 1960s. He consistently denied the influence of these funding sources on his work and the existing scholarship mentions it only in passing. These denials and deflections are a missed opportunity to understand the connection between a holistic view of planetary health and the environmental management ambitions of mid-century and late 20th century multinational oil corporations, as well as Cold War national security and surveillance agencies, although the second set of actors is outside of the scope of my talk today. Gaia is one aspect of my recent book, The Wild and the Toxic. Uh, in it, I examined the political, social, and medical developments in the post-World War II period that gave rise to a multiplicity of claims about the health of ecosystems, the health of the planet, and the health of humans, and which continue to inform contemporary political struggles regarding climate change, sustainability, and the future. In it, I explore how environmental activists embedded health into the protection of the wild, the environment, the planet, and humans, and argue that this history, in particular its connection with health and forms of political action, is integral to resolving our current impasse. In 1961, James Lovelock, who you see here at the top of your screen, began work at the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California. He was hired as a consultant to a team developing technologies for detecting life on Mars. Convinced that life on Mars would look identical to life on Earth, the team designed experiments to test the Martian soil for forms of life that were found on Earth, bacteria, microbes, fungi, proteins. Lovelock doubted that life forms were identical across planets, suggesting instead that life was a matter of behavior. Life on Mars would, in his thinking, exert a similar entropy reducing effect on the atmosphere as it did on Earth. In other words, produce a balance of gases different from their natural equilibrium. With his colleague Diane Hitchcock, Lovelock examined how the chemical composition of the Earth's atmosphere could explain life. The two noted that the composition of gases in the Earth's atmosphere was, quote, improbable by at least 100 orders of magnitude. Just to maintain the balance of methane and oxygen alone would require the annual introduction of 500 million tons of methane 
and twice as much oxygen, neither of which could be produced a biologically. They hypothesized that the atmosphere was, quote, manipulated on a day-to-day -day basis from the surface and that the manipulator was life itself, end quote. Lovelock soon left NASA for the research division of Shell Oil, studying the global consequences of air pollution from fossil fuel combustion. Observing that Earth's atmospheric composition remains in a delicate range outside of which life as we know it would be impossible, Lovelock hypothesized that everything on the planet, whales, viruses, oaks, algae, quote, could be regarded as constituting a single living entity capable of manipulating the Earth's atmosphere to suit its overall needs and endowed with faculties and powers far beyond its constituent parts, end quote. On the suggestion of his neighbor, author William Golding, Lovelock began to refer to his hypothesis as the Gaia hypothesis. Gaia, of course, being the Greek earth goddess whose name uh, was also at the root for uh, the sciences of geography and geology. He presented the hypothesis first at the 1968 meeting of the American Geological Union. It was quite poorly received with the exception of biologist Lynn Margulis, who became Lovelock's closest collaborator through the 1970s. Together, Lovelock and Margulis framed the planet as a single body comprised of diverse internal organs, including atmosphere, forests, oceans, and coastal zones, as having minimal interaction with the external environment of the solar system, and as possessing delicate and complex physiological processes that required constant self-management. In these regards, Gaia bore the marks of late 1960s and 1970s uh, environmental systems thinking. So I'll look briefly at two examples of such thinking. First, a popular understanding of the Earth as a single imperiled entity, and second, an embrace of computer models of the ecological limits to human existence. Some of you in the audience may be familiar with this quote. So the metaphor of spaceship Earth illustrates this popular embrace of limits. Memorably invoked by Vice President Adlai Stevenson at the UN in 1965, Spaceship Earth described life on Earth as a closed and imperiled ecological circuit. Spaceship Earth highlighted the supposed uniqueness and fragility of Earth and rendered the Earth as an ab abstraction upon which parental and stewardship emotions could be laden, implying in the process that humans were the proper pilots of the craft. NASA's Apollo photos taken at this time seem to provide visual confirmation of spaceship Earth's loneliness, fragility, and need for steward stewardship. The iconic Earthrise photo taken in December of 1968 by the crew of the Apollo 8 mission from lunar orbit, showed Earth rising on the lunar horizon. A second frequently reproduced photograph, uh, which of course is on display in many places today, taken by the Apollo 17 mission in 1972, uh, showed the Earth in relief against the surrounding atmosphere. For many of these two images, the second in particular, evoked a popular reevaluation of the 20th century belief in endless technological progress, of which ironically space exploration was a part, and an appreciation of impending ecological limits. Lovelock himself reminisced of the photographs that the start of the Gaia hypothesis was the view of the Earth from space, revealing the planet as a whole, but not in detail. The 1972 volume Limits to Growth reflected another face of this environmental systems thinking. Written by a group of systems scientists at MIT, Limits used computer models of population growth and resource use to protect that within the century, humanity would collide with the planet's carrying capacity. As a result, facing food scarcity and unmanageable increases in pollution. The report, which sold 10 million copies in 30 languages, escalated concerns about the pressure which the human population 
the consumption practices of its most affluent members in particular was placing on the planet as well as a growing confidence in uh, the accuracy of computer modeling techniques. Now, broadly speaking, the 1970s was a time of possibility for environmentalists. The first Earth Day, April 22nd of 1970, was a watershed moment marking the emergence of a self-consciously environmental politics. From Washington, D.C.-based lobbying organizations to small direct action collectives, from re-inhabitation initiatives uh, in California's Sierra Nevada mountains to grassroots anti-toxic campaigns, uh, for example, the one at Love Canal, New York. Environmental activism in the 1970s was suffused with participatory democracy, decentralized decision-making, networking across fields of expertise, experimentation with a range of tactics, and a high level of inter interconnection between activists. By contrast, Lovelock's direct engagements at this time with contemporary environmental issues was controversial. Although he played a central role in the discovery of ozone depletion, he disparaged measures in the late 1980s to restrict the use of CFCs, calling the ozone holes of no consequence to Gaia's health. And against the prevailing environmental consensus, he supported the development and expansion of nuclear power generation on the grounds that radiation was irrelevant to Gaia's health. Furthermore, I'd invite you to think about the quote uh, that was up at the beginning of this talk uh, where Lovelock remarked uh, that Gaia and the environmental movements, which are concerned first with the health of the people, uh, part company. Rather than joining environmental struggles, Lovelock set to work on a system of planetary medicine to treat, as he put it, a, quote, planetary body that is in some way alive and can experience both health and disease. In Gaia, the Practical Science of Planetary Medicine, published in 1988, written as a home medical encyclopedia, Lovelock argued that the time was ripe for abandoning concerns about human rights and human sufferings. The true patient was Gaia, and it was high time for humans to recognize that, quote, we are so tied to the earth that its chills or fevers are our chills or fevers also. Lovelock invited readers to consider that Gaia was a patient arriving at a clinic with disturbing medical records from her pathologist and dermatologist. I'll give you a moment to take a look at this quote. As he saw it, a general practitioner reading these reports would not rush to conclusions, but know instead that old planets can evolve intelligent species with pathogenic capacity. The real threat posed to Gaia was human disruption of homeostasis through industrial agriculture, deforestation, acid rain, the ozone hole, and finally global warming, which he described as Gaia's fever. Lovelock argued that although projected warming was much less than previous episodes of, quote, interglacial fever, the danger was that humans had stripped Gaia of the forests that normally perform the cooling action. Lovelock concluded the text with a plea to consider whether humans wish to become stewards of the earth. He believed this fate was inevitable if Gaia's self-regulation was disrupted. And as he wrote, there can be no worse fate for people than to be conscripted for such a hopeless task, to be made forever accountable for the smooth running of the climate, the composition of the oceans, the air, and the soil. Planetary medicine revealed the larger ambivalence about human agency inscribed within the Gaia hypothesis, in particular, the dual relationship it established between humans as pathogen and humans as healer. Gaia acquired political traction when climate change became a central concern of environmentalism and American society more broadly. In June of 1988, Scientist James Hansen, then director 
of NASA's Goddard Institute for Space Studies, informed the Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee that global warming had begun. Hansen used computer models to demonstrate that the Earth was warmer in 1988 than in any year for which measurements were available, and that extreme climate phenomenon, drought and heat waves in particular, would increase in the near future. Of course, his dramatic testimony, as you all know, did not come out of the blue. Scientists had been tracking planetary temperatures since the 1950s, and lay perceptions of a changing, warming climate trace back to the 1930s. By the late 1960s, meteorological data led many scientists to become quite concerned that the climate was not immune to human intervention. And now, of course, we also know, and I'll come back to this shortly, that during the 1970s, both Sun and Shell oil corporations understood through their own research that fossil fuel combustion contributed directly to global warming. The year after Hansen's announcement, journalist Bill McKibben published the best-selling End of Nature, which I'm sure how many of you in the audience have had the chance to read. One of the first book-length treatments of climate change science for a non-specialist audience. The End of Nature made an impassioned plea for changing the course of human civilization. The crux of its argument was that human activity had left no aspect of Earth's ecological processes untouched. From a Gaian perspective, humans had altered the Earth to such an extent that they would henceforth be required to be its stewards. McKibben's analysis in this text was fueled by moral outrage and defined by a sharp division uh, between the natural or the good and the artificial or the bad. The problem, he wrote, is that nature the independent force that has surrounded us since our earliest days cannot coexist with our numbers and our habits. We may well be able to create a world that can support our, and our habits, but it will be an artificial world, a space station. From a Gaian perspective, McKibben's conclusions were chilling. We have ended the thing that has, at least in modern times, defined nature for us, its separation from human society. While furthering 1970s themes of a planet imperiled by human behavior and the need for enlightened and responsible stewardship, McKibben also incorporated discourses of individual environmental responsibility and guilt quite central to mainstream 1980s environmentalism. The prior decades efflorescence of environmental activism had largely been replaced by a hegemonic group of 10 DC-based environmental organizations, known as the Group of 10, who espoused a reformist understanding of the informed citizen consumer as the principal agent of environmental politics and of technocratic regulation as the goal of environmental politics. The End of Nature's conclusion detailed McKibben's own lifestyle changes. He and his wife stopped taking long drives in the car, they reduced their home's temperature to 55 degrees, and most importantly, they delayed and reevaluated their plans to have children. They began to, quote, prune and snip their desires in ways which he described as as much pleasure as sacrifice. In a confessional tone, McKibben acknowledged that beyond those immediate personal changes, he struggled to imagine what a human society with a lighter footprint would look like. Closing with a plea to use our special gift, as he put it, of reason to decide against continued environmental destruction, McKibben wrote of his hope against hope that the world would choose self-restraint over instant gratification. As we will see, this poignant combination of guilt and asceticism lent itself towards a politics of expert scientific management. Throughout the 1980s, McKibben wrote prolifically on a wide range of topics. By the close of the millennium, he had returned with renewed vigor to the subject of climate change, largely in response to the repeated failure of international climate conferences in that final decade of the 20th century. In 1992, the Earth Summit 
convened in Rio de Janeiro. Although the majority of attendees had called for mandatory limits on greenhouse gas emissions, the United States, then under the George H.W. Bush administration and the world's largest emitter of greenhouse gases, refused to sign anything concrete. The conference ended with a non-committal framework convention on climate change that allowed emissions as usual to continue. Five years later, the UN gathered again in Kyoto, Japan. Despite strident calls by Western Europe to impose strict emissions limits, the final Kyoto Protocol, negotiated with the help of then Vice President Al Gore, exempted developing countries and only required developed countries to reduce their emissions to 1990 levels by 2010. Nonetheless, the US Senate categorically refused to ratify it. In National Geographic in 2006, McKibben offered a dire catalog of what we are in for, widespread and untimely hurricanes, climbing temperatures, melting boreal permafrost and Arctic sea ice. To do this, he quoted Lovelock to this effect. Although our planet, he said, had kept itself healthy and fit for life up until the present, we have given Gaia a fever and soon her condition will worsen to a state like a coma. Continuing on to say before this century is over, billions of us will die and the few breeding pairs of people that survive will be in the Arctic where the climate remains tolerable. McKibben asserted that in response to this, we need a new idea. We need to change dramatically as our light bulbs. We need to see ourselves differently. Identity and desire would have to shift, not out of a sense of idealism or asceticism or nostalgia, but out of a sense of pure pragmatism. I'll return to this idea of pragmatism in the conclusion of this talk. Uh, but first, I'll bring some other parties with a vested interest in the diagnosis and management of Gaia's health into the conversation. So let's turn now to a second history of Gaia. Gaia originated from work that Lovelock did for NASA and Shell Oil in the 1960s. Gaia research continued to be supported over the subsequent decades by Shell and NASA, as well as by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Association, Hewlett Packard, and the British Ministry of Defense. So how does Gaia relate to these seemingly non or anti-environmental organizations? What interest did they have in supporting it? This second history of Gaia I'll offer today examines how four elements of the hypothesis, visualizing the earth as a totality, distinguishing supposedly essential from expendable regions, considering the human species irrelevant to the survival of the planet, and turning ever larger realms of collective decision-making over to experts related to a larger Cold War military and corporate agenda. Today, I'll speak only about the relationship between Gaia and oil corporations, specifically how the participation of oil corporations in the articulation of the planet as an imperiled whole in need of expert management suggests Gaia, Gaia's compatibility to some level with the fossil fuel status quo. One of Lovelock's first assignments at Shell was to offer his predictions on the state of the world in 2000. Positing that the coming decade would likely entail a quote, unpleasant surprise, such as a brush with an ice age, end quote. He painted an optimistic future nonetheless of a post carbon future, replete with widespread public transportation, the rewilding of suburbs, three dimensional television and non-addictive euphoric drugs concluded this way. 
for Shell, Lovelock also researched the connection between carbon dioxide emissions and global climate. When he came to the conclusion that rising carbon dioxide levels were likely to provoke an ice age in the Northern Hemisphere in the coming decades, he was asked to keep quiet about these findings. In a confidential letter from January 1967, Shell's director of research, Lord Rothschild, wrote the following. I particularly don't want you to talk to non-Shell people about the subject of the note you sent me, the weather getting colder and about the cause possibly being fossil fuel combustion products in the atmosphere. Rothschild needn't have worried. Although Lovelock did not keep quiet about the connection he saw between carbon dioxide and global temperature, he did not publish his research in a way that would damage Shell. In a 1971 article for Atmospheric Environment, Lovelock acknowledged the greenhouse effect produced by excess carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. He asked why global temperatures had dropped between 1940 and 1960, despite rising CO2 emissions. To explain this contrary finding, he pointed to a parallel increase in what he called atmospheric turbidity from dust and aerosol particles in the atmosphere. This turbidity had a sunlight obscuring effect that more than offset the heat trapping effect of the extra carbon dioxide. The coming danger Lovelock posited was not a general warming of the planet, but rather that quote, within a few decades, the average temperature of the Northern Hemisphere will approach that of the last ice age. Now, the question to ask really is, in his assessment, who had generated this turbidity? Drawing on satellite photographs of what haze covering the Northern Hemisphere, Lovelock asserted that North America and Western Europe contributed far less than did tropical forests and deserts. Elevated aerosols in these regions were man-made, yet not industrial. The product of the soil disturbing and dust raising activities of the farmers trying to satisfy the demands created by the population explosion. Lovelock suggested a self-regulating quality to the biosphere and identified rainforests and deserts as organs with an outsized influence on planetary health. He also, of course, crafted a clear apology for fossil fuel combustion by rendering carbon dioxide emissions as something to which the biosphere could adapt. As he wrote at the end of the article, we may find in the end that the direct aspects of combustion are the least harmful of all the major disturbances by man of the planetary ecosystem. He identified the real enemy of Gaia as human activities like agriculture, which could irreversibly damage the organs most central to its self-regulation. Now Lovelock's construction of the relationship between human survival and the global climate clearly elided the relationship between imperialism and Cold War militarism. Yet rather than blame him individually, we might understand his conclusions as the outgrowth of his employment, of the interests of the two organizations he himself credited with providing the opportunity for Gaia to develop. NASA and Shell Oil and the Cold War superpower politics and multinational oil corporations they represented held a very strong interest in conceiving of the planet as a self-regulating organism and in defining its health as something to be managed by experts rather than the public. So to think about this, in particular, to think about the actions of uh, oil corporations at this time, I'm gonna lean on Timothy Mitchell's excellent carbon democracy for a moment. When OPEC member states nationalized oil production in the 1960s, multinational oil corporations faced the dilemma of how to pay producer states profits without reducing their own. Their solution was to increase consumer prices by 50%. However, concern that the price increase would prompt consumers to shift to cheaper alternative fuels, oil corporations began to invest heavily in natural gas, 
coal and nuclear power precisely in order to restrict their supply. At the same time, they manufactured the appearance of oil scarcity by producing inflated estimates of future oil consumption and low estimates of remaining reserves, deliberately creating anxiety about impending resource limits. And of course, that fed into, as we talked about, the larger concern in the 1970s uh, with impending ecological limits. In October of 1973, Arab oil producing states linked oil supply to the resolution of the Arab-Israeli conflict. This announcement was directed in particular at the United States' support for Israel during the 1973 war between Egypt, Syria, and Israel. Oil producing states unanimously supportive of Palestine and intending that the United States accept a peaceful resolution to the Palestine question, reduced oil production by 5% each month until Israel evacuated the territories which it had occupied. Saudi Arabia at the same time began an embargo on oil shipments to the United States, which other countries, which other Arab states joined. One result of this oil crisis was a fourfold rise in consumer oil prices, more dramatic than oil corporations had initially hoped for. Now, interestingly, it was at that exact moment that concern for the environment explicitly entered the public persona of oil corporations. Oil companies championed resource conservation and the protection of the environment through PR campaigns and advertising, as well as in their shareholder documents. We also know that this was the precise time when they began researching how fossil fuel combustion affected the global climate. Yet even before the 1973 oil crisis amplified existing anxiety about ecological limits, industry executives directly participated in conceptualizing the planet as an imperiled system whose protection required expert management. Robert O. Anderson, founder and chairman of the Atlantic Richfield Corporation, otherwise known as ARCO, illuminated his industry's point of view. Speaking in 1969 to a UNESCO conference on man and the environment, Anderson acknowledged that we know there is a crisis of the environment. Private industry, large corporations in particular, needed to play, quote, an active and responsible role towards the health of the environment, end quote. Yet Anderson then split the blame, framing pollution as a result of industry's effort to meet increasing consumer demand. He expressed admiration for efforts made by NATO and the UN to address the crisis of the environment and gestured to the promise of a technology intensive future governed by science and bureaucracy. Anderson's vision was not one of an industry attempting to run away from a crisis of its own making. Rather, it was one of an industry controlling that, the articulation of that crisis in order to play a constitutive role in its management. Specifically, by resource intensive strategies, his industry was well positioned to access and implement. Anderson was not the only oil executive to frame the planetary environment as something whose impending crisis called for expert management. Maurice Strong, Secretary General of the first environmental, International Environmental Conference convened by the UN in Stockholm in 1972, was a Canadian oil and minerals multimillionaire and a former president of a large Canadian utility company. In his opening address to the conference, Strong identified its central priority as the creation of a livable environment for all humans, saying the following. Having in this way allocated responsibility to an undifferentiated we, 
Strong identified the solution as one of policy. As he said, we require new institutional patterns which provide for collaboration between governments, the scientific community, and international institutions. Although this reflexive invocation of policy may seem quite normal now, we should ask ourselves whose voices were ignored or sidelined in the process of enshrining expert-driven policy at the heart of uh, environmental protection. These are but a few examples, but they suggest what oil corporations stood to gain from seeing the earth as an imperiled whole at risk from human activity and in calling for an international environmental governance system, which synthesized bureaucracy with scientific and technological expertise. The oil industry's participation suggests it saw a self-interest in furthering a management agenda within which the planet could be framed as a highly complicated and measurable whole. And in the conclusion, I'll reflect on why this might be. This quote here is particularly evocative. Uh, in its last sentence, which really speaks to the dualism uh, at the heart of the Gaia hypothesis, seeing humans as both uh, pathogen and doctor. Now, a compelling explanation for our current planetary environmental crisis holds that oil and other fossil fuel corporations push the planet into ecological catastrophe through their relentless pursuit of profits. To further their objectives, they donated heavily to electoral campaigns and fomented public skepticism and public doubt about climate change. Certainly the proliferation of climate change deniers in the US Congress and now the White House speaks to the success of this multi-decade agenda, as does the state of public skepticism towards climate science. The two histories of the Gaia hypothesis that I offered today demonstrate how a particular discourse of planetary health and its management arose from the entangled actions of certain environmentalists, scientists, and oil corporations. Counter to the standard framing of oil corporations and environmentalists as fundamentally antagonistic, Gaia illustrates some commonalities in their imagination of planetary health, most particularly an imagination of the earth as an imperiled and unique whole, and the belief that expert stewardship would be necessary to protect its health. The Gaia hypothesis, by framing the earth as a homeostatic organism whose health was in peril, also reflected a broader Anglo-American turn away from collective political praxis. Lovelock, who disparaged environmental politics as inevitably human-oriented, offered only individualized solutions for moderating consumption. McKibben claimed in 1989 that, quote, there are no personal solutions to global warming, yet he failed to offer a vision of the collective other than a vague hope that a mixture of fear and the love for nature buried in most of us might rise to the surface. McKibben's subsequent practice of politics as a vehicle for the accurate transmission of scientific data also curtailed other forms of political action. Within this framework of politics, collectivity only exists in petitioning governments to enact scientific data through regulation. Both the turn away from the collective and the embrace of expert management were reinforced by the direction taken, at least in this country, by mainstream environmental politics in the 1980s. Now, Lovelock and McKibben are obviously not responsible for the failure of industrialized nations, the United States in particular, to recognize, prevent, or mitigate anthropogenic climate change. Rather, they reflect a broader neoliberal attitude towards legitimate political action. Their framing of humans as either pathogen or doctor reveals an attitude to power, expertise, and political action that cannot produce a livable future for all humans. 
much less all species. Either option tends towards authoritarianism, the first towards speciesicide, and the other through enlightened management. This embrace of expert management and judgments about what constitutes legitimate politics are likewise constitutive of international climate agreements, as well as news outlets such as the Washington Post and New York Times, which bemoan the Trump administration's evisceration of environmental and climate regulations while simultaneously denouncing the actions of, for example, Dakota Access Pipeline protesters as irrational and illegitimate. Now, the embrace of expert management and the delegitimization of popular democratic contestation historically go hand in hand. Yet alternate responses to climate change arising from dialogue and a practice of more than human democracy are alive and well. Concretely, as you see on the screen before you, we can see the possibilities for such a response in the spontaneous mutual aid organizing of Occupy Sandy and Far Rockaway residents in the aftermath of Hurricane Sandy, as well as the disaster relief efforts of Puerto Ricans following Hurricane Maria. We can see it as well in the Standing Rock Water Protectors embodiment of a politics of coexistence in the service of humans, the land, and the water alike. And I would think that this 50th anniversary of Earth Day is an excellent time to reconsider whose interests we aim to reflect and protect when it comes to environmental protection. Uh, thank you very much uh, for listening to my talk, um, and I certainly look forward to your questions. Thank you very, very much, Jennifer. Uh, that was a really powerful overview of the history of the Gaia hypothesis uh, with uh, much, much for us to consider uh, in these uh, challenging times. So um, I'd like to kind of start off with a, a question and, and my question comes from someone who knows very little about this topic. Uh, but um, I wonder if you could, uh, meditate for, with us a little bit on um, one of the binary, other binaries that you pointed out in your remarks. Um, so the Ga Gaia hypothesis uh, prioritizes expert management. And at one point you pointed out as an alternative, uh, the role of the public. Uh, can you think about any, can we think about any kind of alternative between an expert versus the public binary in going beyond the Gaia hypothesis and pointing forward the way forward to legitimizing popular action uh, politically and, 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 and in a democratic framework? That's a really interesting question. Just to clarify before I start answering, are you are, are you more interested in, in thinking about uh, concrete historical moments where that may have happened or in, in the possibility more generally? Well, I would have to say both. I'm very interested in <laughs> examples of where that has happened and also in looking forward to how uh, that might be encouraged in a way that doesn't necessarily prioritize the role of experts. Mm -hmm. Doing I mean, that what, I'm sorry, I cut you off there at the end. Uh, it, that doesn't prioritize experts in doing the role of encouraging popular action. So, you know, it, it, as you're asking your question, I think that the first place that my thoughts went to uh, was to the 1972 uh, UN Conference on the Human Environment, uh, which was convened in, in Stockholm. Uh, which was, and you know, as, as I mentioned in this talk, and as I'm sure uh, some in the audience know, um, very much dominated by policymakers, scientific experts. Uh, in fact, that was the point. Uh, but it actually wasn't one single conference. It was three simultaneous conferences. Uh, so there was the primary conference. Uh, there was a uh, secondary conference convened by the UN which was meant for uh, environmental NGOs. And then there was a third conference known as the People's Forum, uh, which was largely a spontaneous gathering 
of environmental activists pretty much from uh, all over the world who showed up in Stockholm to really call attention uh, to the need to think outside of uh, these managerial structures for protecting the earth. Uh, so that's really kind of one place that my thoughts go to is, is the role uh, that people played in showing up, um, not necessarily to directly negate and interrupt what was happening at the conference, but rather to demonstrate that there was other ways of thinking about environmental protection, right? That there was other uh, ways of thinking about humans might, how humans might interact uh, with one another and with the planet. And many of the people who attended that conference uh, and that particular portion of it went on to become uh, bioregional activists, uh, direct action, environmental activists, et cetera. But right. I think, you know, to go to the examples I gave at the end, I think, you know, if we think about um, all of these uh, recent examples of environmental politics, what we see people doing there is figuring out ways of collaborating with one another that don't necessarily put um, human interests first or put a regulatory politics first, uh, but assert uh, a different set of ethical values mm -hmm. over and against maybe what we could consider the mainstream or hegemonic approach. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, so I'm looking at a couple of uh, questions that have come in uh, on the chat function. And uh, one of our faculty members in the Department of History, Professor Purnima Davan, who's teaching a course on global environmental history, asks, uh, Professor Thompson, could you please say a little bit more about the fragmentation of expert opinions particularly with the ways in which specific experts are increasingly breaking ranks with both governmental institutions and corporations. Mm -hmm. Do you see this as a hopeful sign or more of the same neoliberal ways of thinking and acting? Wow, that's really a great question. Um, I mean, I, I think, you know, the, now such an interesting time to watch the behavior of scientists, right? If we think about, you know, if we take our attention back for a few minutes and think about um, the 1950s and the 1960s, those were really times when um, in the United States and around the world, scientists were at the forefront um, of many social activist movements uh, and oftentimes were deeply, deeply critical of the behavior of the state and the behavior of corporations. Um, and that uh, that kind of went away for a while. And now we see that coming back, particularly uh, in this country, uh, when we look at, uh, you know, scientists being increasingly silenced uh, by the Trump administration um, and finally uh, reaching a breaking point and fighting back. So I would actually say that is a positive, that is a positive development, uh, right? That, you know, these are people who, uh, you know, realize that they can't ethically I continue to participate uh, within the framework uh, that they had originally signed up to participate within. Thank you. Um, another question is this, what do you, what do you consider uh, to be the role of current grassroots movements, especially from black, indigenous, and people of color communities in the construction of the discourse of climate change what do they contribute and what can we do to support them? Wow, these are, just, these are really awesome questions coming in. Um, I mean, I would argue that it, it's those communities, right? It's frontline communities who are um, obviously experiencing already the effects of climate change, um, which are not at any distance from the effects of uh, racial oppression, uh, particularly in this country, but also uh, worldwide. Um, and it's really to those communities that we need to look to understand not only what the future is going to bring, uh, but to begin to uh, move towards a different uh, liberated society, right? Like it doesn't make any sense to think about an environmental politics that isn't based in 
the experiences of those who are most vulnerable and therefore those who are uh, most affected by uh, climate change and environmental destruction. Thank you very much. Uh, another question that has come in is this, what do you think of the environmental justice movement? Do you think that offers an alternative framework of dealing with uh, Gaia's fever? Mm -hmm. No, I think that's also a really interesting question. I think it intersects a bit um, with the previous question. Um, and yes, I mean, I, I certainly think uh, that environmental justice within uh, the United States in particular, which is of course my uh, field of expertise, um, environmental justice emerged as a uh, counterpoint to the consolidation of the environmental lobby in DC in the 1980s, right? That wasn't the only reason it emerged, uh, but that certainly was uh, a powerful motivation. And in particular, critiquing both the racial exclusivity of mainstream DC-based environmental organizations, but also their incredibly corporate perspective. I mean, what we have to remember is that in the early 1980s, uh, large environmental lobbying organizations deliberately reorganized themselves into something known as uh, the coalition or the group of 10 uh, and intended to model themselves along uh, corporations where uh, the, the leader of these organizations would think of him or herself uh, as a CEO. And so environmental justice was uh, not only spotlighting the very real conditions lived by uh, poor people uh, and people of color in this country, but it was also, uh, you know, calling these organizations to task for corporatizing themselves and prioritizing uh, basically their own interests over uh, the needs of the people and the environment more broadly. Thank you very much. Um, on the role of experts, could you comment on uh, the idea of no, Noam Chomsky and Ernst Meyer for survival of the species uh, in that it may be better to be stupid than smart. Humans show no willingness to tame their technology and affluence, whereas slime molds will outlive us. Um, that's a new idea for me. I hadn't, I hadn't heard that, that one in particular before. Um, I don't know. I think I'm gonna I'm gonna give a no comment on that one. I can't okay. <laughs> I can't say how I fall on that issue. Okay, thank you. Um, what do you think of the envi uh, environmental? Well, that's that's been asked. The environmental justice movement. In the, it, well, in the in in the sense that it offers an alternative framework of dealing with Gaia's fever. Uh, and I guess I would pick, I would piggyback onto that question and, and ask this one. Um, is there an alternative to an understanding of the earth as a system? And if so, how might that intersect with an agenda of uh, pushing back against the hegemony of expert management? Okay. All right. I, I'm going to start an answer. And if I haven't quite apprehended the question, then, you know, we can, you can certainly uh, redirect me. Right. I think, you know, the interesting thing about Gaia is that it is certainly not the first instance of humans conceiving of the earth um, as a living being with an anatomy, right? Like this exists uh, within the West going back many decades before Lovelock. Um, and it exists in, in many other cultural contexts, right? This idea uh, that the earth is alive, um, that certain regions of the earth um, are uh, more significant to its survival, um, or that certain regions of the, you know, the, the earth um, play different roles in the survival uh, of the planet overall, right? And I think um, within that anatomical imaginary, um, it is difficult uh, or it is limiting to just begin to route that into an understanding that because the earth um, is a living being, 
with uh, you know homeostatic processes and organs which exercise certain effects that we need to then uh, step in and play a role in in managing those processes right that is a very uh, 1970s specific uh, in the United States way of thinking right and I think we could turn to uh, many other examples in which I cultures have understood the earth to be alive, yet have not responded with this kind of uh, responsive control, but rather have, uh, you know, sought to minimize their input while understanding um, that humans are also an integral component um, of that living being. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, these are very uh, provocative thoughts. Another question that's come in is this, what kind of rhetoric uh, do you think is necessary to, provoke, to promote, promote a more universal environmental message? Ooh, that's interesting. I mean, I would, I would if, if we were uh, all together in the same room, I think I would ask the, the questioner to define what they mean by a universal environmental politics. Um, mm -hmm. So if you're, if you're still here, whoever asked that, if, if you could give clarification that would be wonderful um, I think in the in the interim I would I would really go back to my answer to a previous question which is I think that a more universal uh, environmental politics stems from attending to the needs of those most vulnerable right and that's not only human communities right that's also uh, encompassing ecosystems uh, species etc but if we focus our attention there, when we say who is being most impacted, who is being most disadvantaged, right? And what does the solution begin to look like, not from an external point, but in their own words and in their own experiences, mm -hmm. then that's how we, in my opinion, begin to move towards uh, what might be considered a more universal environmental politics. Thank you. Um, so uh, another question has to do with uh, the role of government uh, regulation and experts. The question uh, goes like this. Do you see no role for government or multi-government science-based regulation? Uh, this listener is uh, confused by the use of the word expert. Should decisions and act actions be not, not be science-based? Can you comment a bit on that? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, that, that's a good and it's a legitimate question, right? And I think it's the outgrowth of, um, you know, the fact that this is a, a limited talk, right? We're talking about certain kinds of things. And I wanted to pull out uh, certain kinds of uh, similarities between different forms of thinking, right? But certainly, I mean, there's a place for uh, environmental regulation. There's obviously not only a place for, but a desperate need for um, you know, scientific analysis and the valorization of scientific conclusions. What I'd like to encourage us to do, right, is to understand that those are very particular ways of dealing with environmental uh, degradation and planetary crisis, right? And we have to ask ourselves, are those not only the only ways, but are we, by focusing so intensely uh, on expert-driven regulation and management, what are we failing to attend to? Or what might we actually be making worse? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. Um, one more question. Um, what rhetoric would you use to change the minds of conservative political, conservative politically, that is, climate deniers in the United States? Should those groups be a primary target for messaging or is energy best spent somewhere else? I mean, I guess I'm of the opinion that, uh, you know, it's hard to change. It's hard to change people's dogmatic positions. Um, it's not to say that dialogue isn't necessary or that it won't change certain people's positions. Um, but no, I wouldn't say that changing their opinion should necessarily be uh, the central object of uh, an environmental politics. Um, that being said, I think when you start to look at 
uh, people with large amounts of power who are spreading climate denialism or climate science skepticism, uh, those people need to be, you know, called out and confronted uh, quite directly. So I think, you know, in response to your question, or I would say, you know, when it when we're just talking about, uh, you know, people talking to one another, I mean, go for it. But if we're looking at people in power, uh, they need to be confronted and, and held to task for, you know, spreading mm -hmm. misinformation, disinformation, and, you know, quite frankly, harmful information. Yes, I would agree that's an important distinction to make. Well, I'd like to thank very, very much uh, our lecturer today, uh, Professor Jennifer Thompson at Bucknell University for just an extremely, extremely valuable and provocative talk that uh, taught me an immense amount and gave me an immense amount to think about. And I am sure that I speak, speak for our listeners uh, who uh, express also their gratitude. And I would like to thank very much our audience for tuning in. I'd like to thank Alexandra Colley and other staff in the history department for helping to organize this talk. I'd like to thank our other um, co-sponsors. Uh, I'd like to thank Isabel Carrera for her opening remarks. And thank you, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, I'm hoping that at some point uh, I can meet Jennifer in person and <laughs> continue this dialogue. And uh, thank you again, everyone. This has been a very, very uh, inspiring event. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone who was able to attend and those of you who asked questions as well. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. <laughs>